Hey, what's up beautiful people it's cinderama welcome to the channel today we have this very interesting video from thomas sora and it's titled what is happening in israel israeli and palestinian conflict explained thomas sora also there's no news about what is happening in israel right now and um the israel and palestine conflicts going on in the world right now i think it's um, it's been ongoing since on saturday and yeah i'm excited to hear what thomas sora have got to say regarding this or the subject matter like this let's check it out Turning to that breaking news from Israel, the militant group Hamas launching a surprise attack on the country, killing dozens and taking an unknown number of hostages. Israel responding with force and calling the situation a state of war. Israel, we are in war. Not in war, not in war, but in war. Hamas opened in a military attack against the state of Israel and against the people. אנחנו בתוך זה משעות הבוקר המוקדמות. כינסתי את ראשי מערכת הביטחון, הנחיתי קודם כל לטהר את היישובים והמחבלים שחדרו פנימה, הפעולה הזאת מתבצעת בשעות הללו. במקביל הוריתי לבצע גיוס מילואים נרחב ולהשיב מלחמה שערה בעוצמה ובהיקף שהאויב לא הכיר. האויב ישלם מחיר שהוא לא ידע כמותו. אני קורא בינתיים לכל אזרחי ישראל להישמע בקפדנות להנחיות הצבא, להנחיות פיקוד העורף. אנחנו במלחמה, ואנחנו ננצח בה. If Israel just allowed the Palestinians to have a state of their own, there would be peace in the Middle East, right? That's what you hear from UN ambassadors, European diplomats, and most college professors. But what if I told you that Israel has already offered the Palestinians a state of their own, and not just once? but on five separate occasions. Wow. Don't believe me? Let's review the record. After the breakup of the Ottoman Empire following World War I, Britain took control of most of the Middle East, including the area that constitutes modern Israel. Mm -hmm. 17 years later, in 1936, the Arabs rebelled against the British and against their Jewish neighbors. The British formed a task force, the Peel Commission, to study the cause of the rebellion, the commission concluded that the reason for the violence was that two peoples, Jews and Arabs, wanted to govern the same land. The answer, the Peel Commission concluded, would be to create two independent states, one for the Jews and one for the Arabs, a two-state solution. The suggested split was heavily in favor of the Arabs. The British offered them 80% of the disputed territory, the Jews the remaining 20%. Yet, despite the tiny size of their proposed state, the Jews voted to accept this offer. But the Arabs rejected it and resumed their violent rebellion. Hmm. Rejection number one. Ten years later, in 1947, the British asked the United Nations to find a new solution to the continuing tensions. Like the Peel Commission, the UN decided that the best way to resolve the conflict was to divide the land. In November 1947, the UN voted to create two states. Again, the Jews accepted the offer, and again, the Arabs rejected it. Only this time, they did so by launching an all-out war. Rejection number two. Jordan, Egypt, Iraq, Lebanon, and Syria joined the conflict, but they failed. Israel won the war and got on with the business of building a new nation. Most of the land set aside by the UN for an Arab state, the West Bank and East Jerusalem, became occupied territory, occupied not by Israel, but by Jordan. 20 years later, in 1967, the Arabs, led this time by Egypt and joined by Syria and Jordan, once again sought to destroy the Jewish state. Oh. The 1967 conflict, known as the Six-Day War, ended in a stunning victory for Israel. Jerusalem and the West Bank, as well as the area known as the Gaza Strip, fell into Israel's hands. The government split over what to do with this new territory. Half wanted to return the West Bank to Jordan and Gaza to Egypt in exchange for peace. The other half wanted to give it to the region's Arabs, who had begun referring to themselves as the Palestinians in the hope that they would ultimately build their own state there. Neither initiative got very far. A few months later, the Arab League met in Sudan and issued its infamous three no's. 
No peace with Israel, no recognition of Israel, no negotiations with Israel. Again, a two-state solution was dismissed by the Arabs, making this rejection number three. In 2000, Israeli Prime Minister Ehud Barak met at Camp David with Palestinian Liberation Organization Chairman Yasser Arafat to conclude a new two-state plan. Barak offered Arafat a Palestinian state in all of Gaza and 94% of the West Bank, with East Jerusalem as its capital. But the Palestinian leader rejected the offer. In the words of U.S. President Bill Clinton, Arafat was here 14 days and said no to everything. Instead, the Palestinians launched a bloody wave of suicide bombings that killed over 1,000 Israelis and maimed thousands more on buses, in wedding halls, and in pizza parlors. Rejection number four. In 2008, Israel tried yet again. Prime Minister Ehud Olmert went even further than Ehud Barak had, expanding the peace offer to include additional land to sweeten the deal. Like his predecessor, the new Palestinian leader, Mahmoud Abbas, turned the deal down. Rejection number five. In between these last two Israeli offers, Israel unilaterally left Gaza, giving the Palestinians complete control there. Instead of developing this territory for the good of its citizens, the Palestinians turned Gaza into a terrorist base from which they have fired thousands of rockets into Israel. Each time Israel has agreed to a Palestinian state, the Palestinians have rejected the offer, often violently. No phrase represents more of a triumph of hope over experience than the phrase Middle East peace process. A close second might be the once fashionable notion that Israel should trade land for peace. Since everybody seems to be criticizing Israel for its military response to the rockets being fired into their country from the Gaza Strip, let me add my criticisms as well. The Israelis traded land for peace, but they have never gotten the peace, so they should take back the land. Maybe a couple of generations of Palestinians in Gaza living in peace under Israeli occupation and a couple of generations of the occupation troops squelching the terrorists militants, for those of you who are squeamish, would set up conditions where the Palestinians would be free to vote on whether they would like to remain occupied or to have their own state, minus terrorists and their rockets. Casualty totals alone should be enough to show that the Palestinian people are the biggest losers from the current situation, where the terrorists among them, firing rockets into Israel, can bring devastating retaliatory strikes. Why don't the Palestinians vote for some representatives who would make a lasting peace with Israel? Because any such candidates would be killed by the terrorists long before Election Day, so nobody volunteers for that dangerous role. We don't know what the Palestinians really want, and won't know as long as they are ruled by Hamas, Hezbollah, and the like. Whatever the benefits of peace for the Palestinian population, what are the terrorists going to do in peacetime? become librarians and furniture salesmen? So-called world opinion has been a largely negative factor in this situation. Nothing is easier than for people living in peace and safety in Paris or Rome to call for a ceasefire after the Israelis retaliate against people who are firing rockets into their country. The time to cease fire was before the rockets were fired. What do calls for ceasefire and negotiations do? they lower the price of launching attacks. This is true not only in the Middle East, but in other parts of the world as well. During the Vietnam War, when American clergymen were crying out, stop the bombing, they paid little attention to the fact that bombing pauses made it easier for North Vietnam to move more ammunition into South Vietnam to kill both South Vietnamese and Americans. After Argentina invaded the Falkland Islands, if British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher had heeded calls for a ceasefire, that would have simply lowered the price to be paid by the Argentine government for their invasion. Go back a hundred years, before there was the United Nations and before world opinion was taken into account. An Argentine invasion of the Falkland Islands at that time would have risked not only a British counterattack to retake the islands, but also British attacks on Argentina itself. Anywhere in the world, attacks such as those on Israel today 
would not only have risked retaliation, but invasion and annihilation of the government that launched those attacks. Today, so-called world opinion not only limits the price to be paid for aggression or terrorism, it has even led to the self-indulgence of third parties talking pretty talk about limiting the response of those who are attacked to what is proportionate. By this reasoning, we should not have declared war on Japan for bombing Pearl Harbor. We should have gone over to Japan, bombed one of their harbors, and let it go at that. Does anyone imagine that this would have led to Japan's becoming as peaceful today as it has become after Hiroshima and Nagasaki? Or is the real agenda to engage in moral preening from a safe distance and at somebody else's expense? Those who think negotiations are a magic answer seem not to understand that when A wants to annihilate B, this is not an issue that can be resolved amicably around a conference table. Oh my goodness. I don't know to what end this is going to be, but all the same, I'm just going to be biased on this one. I'm sorry. But I... I stand with Israel on this one. I'm, I mean, I'm Christian and I'm definitely always going to support or stand with Israel because Israel is God's people. If you follow the Bible or what's written in the Bible, Israel is God's people. And honestly, if Israel, Israel has given the land or part of the land to Palestine, then they should follow suit, they should do it because I don't get it and I don't understand the constant going into war and the conflict that keeps happening years and years and years and affecting people's lives and everything. They should call it truce and it should die down and let everybody move on and remain in their territory. That should be fair because I still don't understand why in this day and age people stick or countries or nations still go into war. I mean, I understand that this was what they used to do back in the day to acquire lands, properties and everything and still ongoing now is it still don't make sense to me maybe somebody would explain it but all the same i really love your contribution in the comment down below what are your thoughts about this particular conflict between israel and palestine i mean everybody feels differently about subject subject matters to topics like this and i really love your contribution in the comment down below i mean we can always come to an agreement where we share different opinion and respect each other without causing conflict irrespective of what you believe or what your opinion or difference of opinion is. But I really love your honest contribution in the comment down below. You can share all the useful information you think might be really helpful. And until next time, see you in the next video.